it is over. I don't know how else to say it. I've sold my Amazon business. I am done, I'm quitting, I'm out of the game. It's been almost, almost five years of a lot of stressful moments, a lot of sleepless nights, some, some excruciatingly painful moments, a lot of good times as well, but I'm quitting. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about why I decided that now was the time to quit, how I actually went about the process of exiting my business and selling and getting out, and what I think is coming for you or Amazon sellers who choose to stay in the game. So you might not like what I'm about to tell you. I'm not that bullish on Amazon anymore, but I'm gonna give it to you straight in this video because I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I would want to be authentic and honest with you, just like I would with a close friend, just like I am. This is exactly what I am saying to close friends around me in real life. So if you are selling on Amazon, if you have thought about getting out or if you're thinking about it in the future, um, or if you're on the fence, then watch this video until the end. I may just convince you that it's the right decision to make. So first, why did I quit? Why now, why am I getting out? So when I told my student group this, the FBA Food Mix Alley, um, the first and the most common question was, why exit now? So is the Amazon FBA opportunity, is it dead for beginners? Will Amazon still have long-term sustainability? So is Amazon FBA dead? My short answer is yes. It may well already be dead for beginners. Um, but it does depend on who you are and where you're coming from. So I'm going to run through in detail um, later in the video why I think it really depends on which group you are and, and exactly who you, who you, uh, which group you'll fit into, sorry. But if you're not a beginner, let's say you're an existing seller like I was, then it's a bit different. So now I'm going to give you, at this point in time, I'm going to give you the framework for how I decided personally for me that it was time to quit as basically the owner of a successful Amazon business, uh, we were on our way to hit eight figures per year in revenue. So uh, let's run through, these are the things both that I was thinking about and then also some things that I realized after going through the process and actually being on the other side um, that I should have been thinking about as well. So first of all, is your goal to exit or to build passive cash flow? So I very, very strongly believe that the value maximizing strategy or the, the way to make the most money with Amazon is to build to exit. I think it's really, really silly to be thinking of Amazon listings or your Amazon business basically as a stable long-term cash flowing asset. I think that is very silly. It may be as part of, let's say a diversified portfolio. So that's inside like this like slick operational machine, which is the, the aggregators that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and basically whatever companies uh, end up taking these large portfolios of many Amazon businesses or Amazon brands and eventually taking them public. That to me seems like the natural end state. So, so these aren't, we're not building houses here. We're not building things on real land. We're not building real estate. Um, and like, how confident are you that you're like garlic press listing? If you just packed up and walked away and you went on, on holidays for like, you know, a few years or something, you walked away from it today. Like, is that garlic press listing really going to be producing profitable passive cash flow in like five years, three years, five years, ten years? I'm not confident in that at all. So for me, an Amazon business always has been, but it's just more recently that I've become more aware of this and just more firm in my belief. Amazon business is either growing towards an exit or it's slowly dying. So you pick and choose which one it is. Are you growing towards the exit or are you slowly slowly dying? My opinion you should always be building towards an exit. So that's the first part of the framework. Second part is now a good time to sell in the marketplace itself. So I mentioned a few times on this channel, if you've been watching my videos, which I know I don't post that often anymore, um, but my more recent videos, basically if you're the owner of a large and high quality Amazon FBA business, now is the time to sell. Aggregators wanna gobble you up, they wanna gobble up your business and they wanna pay you or they wanna throw money at you to be able to have the privilege of doing so. Uh, could it get even better than where it is now? Yes, it could. But I personally try really hard not to let FOMO or the fear of missing out, the fear of missing out on additional future gains. I really try not to hard, try hard not to let FOMO dictate my current actions. So uh, the short answer is that yes, now is a really great time to exit. Will it get better? It could, but you know, to me, that's, it doesn't matter whether it's gonna get better in the future. What matters is, is it a good time now? It is. So I had to consider some of these other factors to actually help me to make this decision. So, but ask yourself the question, is now a good time to sell in this marketplace? Is it a, is it a, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Right now it's a seller's market if you again have a high quality Amazon business. So uh, the next one is, is it a good time to sell in your own business, in your own trajectory? So forgetting about the marketplace right now of, of Amazon businesses, 
What is your business doing right now? What is your plan? Where are you going? What is your growth plan and your trajectory going uh, right now? So in our case, in my personal case, we had hit an internal inflection point this year in 2021. So we were coming off the back of massive growth uh, during COVID. We did some stuff in the build up to COVID and then what happened in 2020 and up to the start of this year was just you know an acceleration of that growth. So where I was asking myself is now a good time to sell for me and for us and for our business plan. It wasn't that we couldn't grow further from where we were, but it really wasn't going to be as easy as it was over the last year or the last 18 months, let's say. So we had a, a really detailed plan to grow, let's say 100%. It was about 100% from where we are now in revenue terms, not profit, but revenue. So that's some pretty big numbers. That's going from we're at uh, around about 8 million in the last year, going to 16 million. But I knew that resource-wise, the amount of energy and effort and, and changing the team structure and hiring at least one or two new people to do that and the personal involvement that would be required for me to do that and for our team to do that and for our business to grow to that next level. It would really take a long time. It would take a while and basically a lot of work. And, and it's the personal mental energy as well that, um, that was just, it was a lot to take. So was I ready to do that? It turns out I wasn't, okay? So for me personally, I was thinking as well, another point is that could somebody else do that to the business? And the answer is definitely yes. Like this plan was a very solid plan. And so basically could another company just come in with the resources and the energy to make this, to, to make this thing happen or this change happen that I personally didn't have? Um, the answer was yes. So this was really for me personally a major reason why I wanted to just pass the business and brands onto someone else who could do it justice. Uh, and so basically, Personally, again, irrespective of what is the rest of the uh, marketplace of Amazon business is doing, for me personally, it is or was a good time to sell. Next, what are the opportunity costs? What are you giving up by not selling your business? Or alternatively, you could say, what are you actually going to do once you sell your business? Both of those ways are, are valid ways of looking at this. So your course of action, this is how I think about it. Your course of action always should be or has to be compared to the next best available option, right? So if you've, my, if, you, pardon me, if you've watched my last few videos on this channel um, or you've read the blog, then you know that I'm really, really bullish on crypto at the moment. I have been for a while. I didn't really talk about it two years ago <laughs> because it was pretty uncool to talk about then. Maybe it's still a little bit uncool, but it's, it's a bit more acceptable for me to actually tell you how bullish I am on crypto now. So for me personally, the way that I look at this literally all, everything financial anyway, is that I have to compare it against crypto, which is the next best available option or potentially the best available option. Everything has to be compared against the potential gains and returns or interestingness of projects or businesses within crypto for me to see the true opportunity cost. So here's an interesting exercise, which I'm gonna give you. And this is one that I did. Go ahead and check the dates of when you put money into your Amazon business. So you, to start a business, you require startup capital, right? So maybe if you were doing this as a sole prop, it's just coming out of your personal bank account. But let's make it a simpler example and assume that you have an LLC. So you put money into that LLC so that it can be invested into buying products and inventory and, and all your other expenses. Just write down the date of when you did that and how much at each point in time that you put money into the business to, to be used as capital. Now, this is more applicable to people who've actually been selling on Amazon for a while. So let's say more than a year, two years, something like that. For me, I've been selling for nearly five, had been selling for nearly five years. So the exercise is take those same dates and those same dollar values in US dollars that you put into the business and then calculate that if instead of putting the money into the business, you would instead just bought Bitcoin on each of those dates and then just go and go on and like sat on the beach for a while. How much money would you have today in Bitcoin if you had done that? Or Ethereum, whatever, same, same idea. So in my case, if I had invested all of the money that I did when I started, which was at the end of 2016, start of 2017, uh, was when I was putting most of that money into the business. If I had just put that into Bitcoin, the opportunity cost, the next best available uh, alternative option, and then I had gone and kicked back on the beach, would I have made more money doing that or more money by creating this Amazon business and then selling it? So I'm not gonna lie, like I'm not gonna lie just to, to make this point stronger or whatever. The investment was worth more money in my Amazon business than it would have been if I had just invested it in Bitcoin or some other um, crypto by about a factor of three or four, if my memory serves me correctly. But to get that three or four X return over five years, I put in thousands and thousands of hours of work into building this business. 
It wasn't just work, it was stress. Like I said, many sleepless nights and, and a lot of effort and a lot of risk too. And here's the thing, the performance of my Amazon business throughout those years between 2017 to 2021 was statistically speaking, it was an outlier. We did really well. So the question that I had to ask myself is, did I think that I would continue to do as well as I had between up until now and then going forwards into 2022 and 2023? Relative, not just you know relative to a baseline of zero, but relative to the next best op- uh, available option or the opportunity cost, which is crypto. And, and even if we did continue to outperform the next best option, would it be worth the continual stress and the additional, basically the requirement to have to work actively in the business? Personally, I didn't think so. So that's the other thing I was thinking about is opportunity cost. Now, the next one is timing or constraints. So are there other timing or constraints or things that you need to be working around um, that actually dictate whether it's a good time to sell or a bad time to sell? Maybe this doesn't affect all sellers, um, but our business was highly Christmas seasonal. So if you've ever seen my sales updates on this on this channel, um, you'd notice in one of my first ever videos that I released was talking about my Christmas results or Q4. So for us, we basically have this like pretty flat throughout the year and then November and December, just like this boom, 40 to 45 to 50% of our entire year's sales happen in that, let's say two month period. I can't remember the exact numbers. So what that means is that basically the the, a lot of the profiles of the business really vary a lot throughout the year. So the risk varies a lot throughout the year. So the risk basically rises and rises and rises to just before Q4 because we've got 50% of the year's results that we don't know yet. And yet we've, you know, 80% of the year has elapsed. We've done um, 80% of the work, but only received 50% of the benefits. So then after a mad November, December, then suddenly uh, basically everything dies back down again, but also the risk drops back down again. So we had to really consider this because Essentially, it's not, it wasn't practical for us to try and sell the business just before Q4. So both from a couple of things, the operational handover, or actually having all of this being managed and actually like handing over this business that you know, is doing a lot of revenue per day, has a lot of shipments coming, containers every single week, um, and, and actually being able to hand that over to the buyer, doing that just before Q4 when everything needs to be dialed in per- perfectly to be able to execute on the remaining 50% of, the, of your financial results you know, that's, that's really impractical to do. Um, and it's risky. And so a buyer doesn't want to do that. And I guess the other thing as well is in terms of timing and other constraints is that, I mean, for our perspective, like essentially if we're doing 80% of the work and then we sell the business, we're going to receive 50% of the results. So the buyer would then get 50% of the results and have none of the work, but also from their flip side, like they don't have the control going into Q4. So essentially for us, timing was a constraint. We really, really wanted to sell either between January uh, and then up to like July at the latest. And as a side note, I didn't sell by then. We sold a bit later and it was quite stressful for that, for that reason and others. Uh, the next framework here is not one that I was thinking about as much when I was selling. So this wasn't part of my why before, but now that I look back on it, it, it should have been. It, it was, but I wasn't that conscious of it. That is, are you enjoying what you're doing and does it still have a purpose for you? So my goal When I started the Amazon game, I'm very transparent about all this. You can go back to the very first video on my channel. You can see exactly why I was doing this Um, because I I read out a letter that I wrote in 2016 when I I started doing this. My goal was to make money. Uh, I wanted financial freedom and I wanted that money that I was gonna make through Amazon. I wanted that money to solve my problems. I wanted to solve the problems in my life so that I could live an easy life. Not just me, but I wanted it for the people around me, my loved ones, my family, the people that I love and cared for. So fast forward to 2021, where we are now, I already got financial freedom a while ago. And you know what? Having money and time as well, having money and free time, it doesn't magically make your problems go away. It doesn't make you happy. I know this is like silly, you know, it's, you've read it in every single book, self-help, blah, blah, blah. But at, sometimes you need to learn these lessons yourself. Money doesn't make you happy, neither does free time. What it does, what they both do in combination with each other is they give you the option, they give you the potential, the capacity to, Create a space where you can actually go ahead and do the work that you need to do to make yourself happy or to make yourself satisfied with your life and to solve the problems that are probably still gonna be there once you get the money in the free time. So yeah, it seems cringy, but but I guess after a certain point, the thing that's making you money, in this case, the Amazon business, it could actually become the thing, the obstacle that's holding you back from creating that space that is what you really need to actually go and do the work to solve the problems to become happy. I hope that makes sense. 
And for me personally, in the end, that's what, that's what my attachment to my Amazon business was. In the end, it, it was becoming over time as I made more money, but like didn't change these other things or didn't create that space in my life. It became the obstacle more than the solution. So of course I'm writing this now with the, with the benefit of hindsight, right? So I've got all these notes here and like, as I write these, these things down, it seems super obvious and clear, but to be honest, it was only after I got on the other side of, of selling the business and, and had quit already, <laughs> not in the process of deciding to quit, but it was only after I breathed that what I would call fresh air on the other side, where I am now standing today, um, did I realize that this was actually a huge sort of more unconscious reason for me to quit. It was a reason why I should have quit. And at the right time too, I'm not saying that I should have done this earlier. Um, I'm also not complaining at all, but, but like I said before, I'm, I'm being authentic with you. I'm speaking with you as I would a close friend. And then that's just, that's how I felt about this. So, okay. So that's the framework that you can use. These are some things that I was thinking about. These are the things that I was thinking about that told me it was time for me to quit. It was time for me to get out and exit and, and move on to other things. And of course, I'm not saying that it is time for you to quit, only that it was time for me to quit. So that's that. First one was the why. Second one, how, what was it actually like to sell my business, to go through the process? So look, in this video, I'm just gonna tell you what it was like personally, uh, which in summary, it was an emotional roller coaster. It was very stressful. I had a very stressful period of months going through, not just the actual sales process, but all of the thinking and the planning and the having to continually, for me personally, uh, readjust my plans and my goals for the, for the future going forwards. I had, it felt like I had to do this a lot of times. Um, before I decided to sell, while I was deciding to sell, then like just different time frames. I'm gonna speak about it personally now in this video. And what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna make a much more detailed video on the actual mechanics of how to sell an Amazon business. So the actual process that I went through. Um, if you wanna know this, the steps in the process, both short term, uh, what you should do if you're more on the beginner side, if you wanna know if you're ready to sell, if you're even going through the process right now, um, then, Watch out for this video. I'll talk about yeah, set, how to set up a business to exit. Because remember, I believe that you should be selling, you should be building a business to exit from the start, from day zero. Uh, when you should start looking, some of the stuff that I talked about before and how to maximize the dollar amount as you go through it. Maximize the dollar amount as you exit and also to minimize the risks, both, both two different sides of the coin. If you wanna hear about that, uh, subscribe to the channel. Make sure to turn on the notification so that you get that video when I release it, which won't be too long from now. I am back into into making these videos again. Uh, but for now in this one, I'm just gonna go over two things that basically I wish I knew before I went into this process of selling my business and two things that I would do differently if I could go back and do it again, okay? So remember, full version coming later, this is just a summary or a, a redacted version. The first thing that I wish I knew before going through the process of selling my Amazon business is I wish I, someone had told me and told me how to do a thorough audit of my business and its risks before I got into the process of selling my business. So the way it's gonna work is any potential buyer is gonna do a very thorough, thorough pardon me, what's called due diligence of your business. So this is a mergers and acquisitions term, which I had never heard of before, but pretty much what they, what they wanna know a couple of things. They wanna know how risky is your business? So the, the things that you're doing, the type of model you're using, the type of products you're selling, the way in which you're selling them, how risky is it? They wanna know, can I grow it or how can I grow it? So basically, you know, you, you've got the amount of profit you've made and, and the products that you have, but they wanna know what can they do to increase the, the, the top line and the bottom line. They are also gonna to want to know how easily can I plug your business into my business? How easily can I integrate it? You know, are you, I don't know, is stuff happening in your garage? Are you shipping stuff from your garage? Whatever, like stuff like that. How easily can they actually take that thing and then just like put it into their business? Uh, that's the First three things. And then the, the last thing is, am I getting what I'm paying for? So you're gonna present your business to them. They will see your products. They will see the revenue. They will see the numbers, the, the books that, that you give them, your, your profit and loss, whatever. And they wanna know, is it true? <laughs> or is there something that you're not telling them? Now, here's the key thing is the, the valuation, the, the amount of money that you actually make and the smoothness through which, this, through which you go through this process, the smoothness of the deal, will be dependent on them being able to tick these boxes. So they need to be able to understand the risks. If they can't understand the risks, they won't buy it because the people who are doing this, they're smart. They don't get into things that they don't understand. Um, 
they need to know that they can grow it and have a plan to be able to do so. They need to know that they can actually easily plug it into your, in, plug your business into theirs. If they aren't sure if they can do it, they just won't buy your business. They'll opt out. There's plenty of other ones out there. And so you really don't want to get caught on the back foot by, by something not being the way that you said it was or the way that they thought it was as it first appeared on paper when they started looking at your business, when you started talking to them, when they maybe offered you a, a certain amount of money at the start. Because, I mean, basically what you're giving them, if it's got your books or whatever else, generally, if something is not the way it's, it should be or not the way that it seems, and essentially the answer to their question, am I getting what I'm paying for? If their answer is no, I'm not getting what, I'm actually, what I actually thought I was paying for. Generally, they're only going to be reducing the amount of money they pay you rather than increasing it. Sometimes it could work the other way, but generally it's going to be like that. For example, uh, actually, no, like one more point, one more point. The deal is going to be all about trust and communication. So like if these things start appearing, start bubbling up from, from the, the you know, hidden beneath, beneath the surface in terms of like, oh, actually, you know, your profit wasn't what you said it was because of this little thing, or let's say your products uh, didn't have a certain certification, something like that. Yeah, if you didn't know about it, okay, that's not a direct breach of like trust, but it's going to breach their trust in your competence as a seller, or it's, at least it's going to tarnish the trust, right? You think about it from their perspective, they're thinking, hmm, you know, like this guy hasn't picked this up or he doesn't know about this, about his business or he wasn't doing this properly. Like what else is he missing? Not that he's saying doing it deliberately, but like he's clearly not got everything figured out. So, and, and here's the thing is Amazon sellers, as independent Amazon sellers, we don't really look at our business. I didn't look at my business to the same level of detail that a dedicated team of people who do due diligence for professionally for a living and have done so for decades. I don't look at my business with the same level of detail that they did. And this is what happened. And this is what I'm recommending that you do is go through. And like I said, do an audit, like figure out how to do it. Some of the things that I'm talking about now are, are, are like, uh, they, they seem obvious, but they're not necessarily, particularly if, uh, like in my case, you aren't actually necessarily planning to definitely sell your business when you start going through this process, because I wasn't. And this was an evolving process for me. And so when I started having conversations, it wasn't like I had done weeks and, or months of preparation in terms of like, all right, I'm gonna sell the business. It, it, all of the things started aligning as I was getting further into this. And then eventually I was like, oh, this is the right time to sell. But it meant that I hadn't done this order. Uh, and so I'm lucky in a way in that, yeah, we, we had a lot of things well you know, dialed in, but there were some things that weren't. So tips, um, keep your accounting books really clean. Know your numbers, know your costs, know that they're accurate, know they're up to date. That's a, probably a very pertinent issue now, or maybe not so much right now because it's been a while, but you know, shipping costs increasing, like make sure that those are actually reflected correctly. It seems basic, but don't take me, take my word for this. It's not necessarily a basic thing that you are doing. Have, like I said, certifications, approvals, um, both on the, both on the legis legislative or regulatory side. So that's like legally, legal requirements. And then also make sure that you're meeting Amazon's requirements. Um, what else? Importation as well, be 100% compliant with your importation process. If you are, for example, if you're cutting costs somewhere that they won't be able to cut because you're actually not doing things properly, you're just saving money by, I, I don't know an example, you're putting in the wrong HTS code or something. So you're paying a lower duty rate than you should be. That's not gonna fly when they buy your business. They're gonna to have to do things properly. So you will actually get your profit reduced because your costs will go up because you are actually, well, you should have been paying more duties than you actually have been paying. Things like that. Again, I normally pride myself on attention to detail, but we uh, did make stumbles in this area and it is just not a good look. So that is the first thing. And the second thing is that it's much, much better if you act as if you do not want to sell and act as if you will not sell until the day that it actually happens and you actually receive the money in your bank account and you have sold the business. Because I can speak from, from experience and say that uh, it, it just took a while. It took a lot longer than I thought. And again, when I went into this, I wasn't sure if I was going to sell, if I wanted to sell. And then halfway through the process, I became determined to sell. And suddenly I felt like a lot was on the line and I needed to sell the business. And as soon as that happens, you really lose a lot of leverage, first of all, because you're desperate to sell, or not desperate as such, but like you're invested in the outcome, in an outcome that hasn't happened yet. And what that means is that anytime there's a roadblock, anytime there's an obstacle, anytime something doesn't go your way or isn't going your way, it's gonna cause you a lot of stress as you're thinking about this future reality, let's say. And I'm speaking from experience here, this is what happened to me. 
um, you're, you're thinking about, okay, getting over the line, selling the business. You're thinking about the money being in your bank account, but it isn't yet. And so anytime that reality becomes less certain because you mess something up or because, I don't know, you buy a back sale, whatever, these things could happen. Um, that's going to hurt a lot, particularly when if, if this is your only brand, if this is your livelihood, if this is a life-changing amount of money for you, and, and suddenly you're really invested in receiving this amount of money, like anytime you get anything below the baseline or it just doesn't seem a certain anymore, that's really going to hurt. So I'm gonna, not going to keep belaboring this point, but for me personally, uh, it was a real change in, it was a liberating change in thought process. As soon as I, I was halfway through the process and it was going longer than I expected and it wasn't going as good as I expected and I kind of just wanted to be done with it. I kind of just wanted to sit back and relax and have the money in my bank account, which is normal. But, and it was getting to me, the stress was getting to me. And then I finally decided like, okay, actually, let's just imagine that I am gonna grow the business myself. I'm gonna take that growth plan that I told you about. I'm gonna grow it 100% myself with my team. I'm gonna step back in. I'm gonna you know, put my shoes on and get back to work. And that's not so bad. <laughs> it's not such a bad outcome. And as soon as I could actually think about that happening, rather than just thinking about the money being in my bank account, um, it, I, it felt really good again. And then we sold and I got the money. So. That's the second thing, just it's better to like not place so much stress and so much emphasis on this outcome that as of yet has not happened. One last thing I'll cover while I'm talking about this now in this video is the question, should you use a broker or should you go and do this independently? Um, to be honest, Adam Heist has a really good video on this. I didn't follow his process because I think I watched the video after I was already doing this, but it's a really good video. Uh, I, if I remember, I will link it down below. And I will also create a video basically just showing you how I did it. So I personally did it independently. I did not use a broker uh, and I probably saved about half a million dollars. So I think it was worth it, but I can see the pros and cons of both sides doing it independently or using a broker. So for example, if someone had told me the above two lessons that I just told you, then it really would have made the process feel nicer for me. I don't think the amount of money would have changed, but I would have felt better about it. Really with those two things that I told you were probably the key things for me. Um, and so I think that if a broker does really walk you through that process, it could make no difference because if you go and do this yourself before you try and sell the business is go and do an internal audit, make sure that everything is in line, all your, your, what are your, your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted, then maybe there's no additional value. But I think, you know, part of learning and becoming better at something is that you need to do, and I'll talk about this in a second, is that you need to do things multiple times. You need to learn and make mistakes. And when you're selling a business, potentially this is the only time you'll ever do it in your life once. And so you just don't get that second or third or fourth or fifth chance to do things better. Um, so I can see the value of both sides. Personally, I did it independently. All right, so again, I will be talking about this process of how, just to remind you in the next video. So if you haven't already subscribed and turn on the notification bell, so you get that when it comes out. So next, uh, how selling the business was for me. How does it feel now? I'm not gonna to talk too much about this either. I've got some other videos to come out about the topic. Um, to be honest, it feels really freaking good to be on the other side. And I hadn't decided that I was actually gonna get out of the game completely, like out, as in I'm not going to go back and start another Amazon business. I hadn't made that commitment until I sold the business and I took some time off and, and reflected and thought about things. And it's been a couple of months now. And now I can tell you that it feels really liberating to just be on the other side. That, that's it, like, it feels good. The, the blunt truth is that very few Amazon sellers really care about the products they're selling to their customers. They, they don't know their customers and they don't really care about the product. Uh, most Amazon sellers, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm right on this, is that they're attracted to the money they're gonna make and they're attracted to just like I was, the idea of the freedom that, that money will give them. And so the freedom feels really great. The freedom feels really great. Having the money allows that freedom. And I think depending on how your business is, is running, maybe you're already there as an Amazon seller, but definitely once you get to the other side and you have that time to reflect, I believe that you'll you'll enjoy it. <laughs> that's, that's how I feel about it anyway. Okay, we've talked about why I sold my business. We've talked about how I sold my business. The last thing, <laughs> the last topic that I wanna to touch on is what's coming next for you, for Amazon, for Amazon sellers, people who are wanting to get into the game, are in the game, people like yourselves, what comes next? I'm gonna be really blunt here. I think that the Amazon FBA business model is dead for a lot of people. And I think it's dying for a lot of others in the next few years. I, 
if you really don't like what I just said, then you can dislike the video. But I'm again, I'm just trying to be honest and authentic and as genuine as I possibly can with you. So one point I want to touch on before I explain my thoughts as to why I think that Amazon FBA as a business model, as it's presented, is dead for maybe for you, definitely for a lot of people. Everyone else who's still saying that it's a wonderful business model and it's great, you know, passive or, or semi-passive income stream. The blunt truth is that most of those people at this point in time, they are selling courses and they are directly financially invested in the outcome of you believing that it's a good business model. And it will affect their livelihood in a negative way if they tell you what I'm about to tell you. So I'm, I don't know, tell me, leave me in the comments down below. Is there anyone else who you know of who's out there on the internet talking like I am on, on to these stupid YouTube videos who knows Amazon intimately, who has a successful, let's say seven or eight figure business like I had and doesn't have a course to sell you either directly or indirectly through affiliate income, which is another thing, but it's still affecting their livelihood and does say what I'm saying, which is that I think it's kind of dead. I literally have nothing to gain. I, I make basically nothing to this channel at the moment. Um, so what you're gonna hear in this video on this channel going forwards and, and always, I've always tried to do this is exactly what I would tell you if, if you were my best friend. So uh, the last thing here is as well is it's never very wise to just listen to someone's words, pay attention to their actions. Instead of looking at their mouth and seeing what they're saying or hearing what they're saying, pay attention to their hands and where their time and their energy and their money is going. I can tell you now I sold my business and I'm gonna talk about more what I'm doing next, but that's just you know some, some words of advice, I guess. So there are three things that I would be very, very wary of in the future, in the near, medium, and long-term future if I was still an Amazon FBA seller. Three things. First of all, inflation and cost pressures. Costs are going up. I don't wanna talk about it too much in this video, but you know what I'm talking about. It's supply chain and it's rising costs and fees. Uh, here's an article, I'm not gonna, I might link it, but it's an article I read today in the New York Times and Amazon is actually forecasting for their, for their actual warehousing FBA business they're forecasting to not make a profit in Q4. And that is just because of rising labor and material costs. So I'm just gonna put it out there, but how likely is it that they, at some point in time, start passing on their cost increases? Because basically what's happened is they're making the same revenue, but their costs have gone up such that they have no profit, at least in the short term, right? So they're thinking long-term, so that's okay for them. But how likely is it that they start to pass on, pass on some of those cost increases to you or to other people who are involved in the ecosystem? I think it's relatively likely. So this is also getting more big picture macro stuff, but um, uh, personally, I don't believe that we are reverting back to a globalized world. Like I think peak globalization has come and gone. I think the trend is reversing. Uh, if you're interested, let me know in the comments. I can expand on the, these topics. And this is stuff that I know a lot more about now than I did, let's say a year or two years ago. But I believe that the, the golden age of these easy, lean, efficient, cheap supply chains where anyone can just go to a factory in China or anywhere anywhere around the world, but particularly China, and go to a factory and just start making stuff in small quantities for cheap and getting it shipped easily into the US. I, I think we're moving away from that world. I think you should get used to increasing costs, um, increasing complexity as well. So on the one hand, this is gonna be hurting your brain because you have to deal with the complexity because you're the seller, you're the guy managing all of these things. And on the other hand, it's hurting your income statements, hurting your back pocket, your wallet. Uh, advice here, I mean, this, this is what I would be really worried about, but advice, I would be looking to shorten your supply chain if you can. I would be looking to produce as close as possible to where you're selling. So if you're selling in the US, I don't know, look at Mexico, look at somewhere else that's not in China to actually be able to produce your goods. This is gonna be harder. This is gonna be harder. This is not the way that the Amazon FBA business model is taught. The way it's taught is you go on Alibaba, you look for a Chinese supplier and you know you just sell the same thing as everyone else. I, I really don't think that that's gonna get more viable again in the future. I think it's just going the other way. I think we're past it. Um, if you're selling in Europe, like there, there are lots of manufacturing bases close to the close to where the Amazon marketplaces are. And if you can do that, I think I think you're locking in a strong advantage for the future because the the sim, the advantage of this Amazon FBA business model pr previously was that it was super simple. You just went on Alibaba, you found the same you you know found the supplier that was already selling to your competitors on on Amazon, and then you just Got products from them but if you start going locally you have some advantage if you are sourcing from mexico it's probably because you're mexican or it's probably because you can speak spanish and so you can go and get on the ground and do the work that had to be done before we reach this peak globalization so that's the first point is 
I'm very, very wary uh, on, on inflation going forwards and increasing cost pressures. The second thing, slowing growth. So in my opinion, pre-COVID, just, being, just before COVID, just before 2020, was the best time to be a seller because you basically had a foot in the door of this Amazon game before this madness started, before this global um, huge acceleration of e-commerce and you know, lots of other things started. Then when there was this massive boost in sales, which was you know, just after the initial wave in 2020, all you had to do was just be smart and actually take advantage of this river of money essentially. So that's how we tripled our business in one year was because we had our foot in the door. We had brands established before 2020. Uh, we actually had a whole bunch of growth coming just as 2019 finished and just at the start of 2020. And then it all just like came together. So at first it went down, but then it went way up. And, and because we were in the right place at the right time, luck, and because we had good processes in place, not luck, that's work, then we were able to take advantage of those two things to move quickly, to leverage that good luck and, and the work that we've done to get even better results. And so we tripled in, in 12 months. But here's the thing, mean reversion is a thing. Nothing goes exponential forever. And so the growth that happened in the last year where you're just seeing all these, you know, these sellers just blowing up and, and now they're able to sell their businesses for large amounts, that doesn't keep happening. What happens is you get reversion. So growth curves are S-curves, not exponential curves. What first accelerates, so COVID 2020 up to now basically was, was, a, was a really big acceleration, but now there's a deceleration. And I don't want you to misunderstand me here. E-commerce is definitely gonna continue to grow and, and maybe later on it accelerates again, but at least in terms of recent memory, recent history, which is the year just gone, it's not gonna grow as fast as it did. And that's okay, but in, a, in this new world that we live in, everyone and their dog and you know the dog's investment manager is aware of this opportunity now. It's no longer this thing where you know we live where everyone's doing remote working, everyone is looking for work online, everyone's looking for these, everyone has been exposed to Amazon or online shopping because they had to be because they were stuck in quarantine. So it's not like it was in 2014, 2017, or even 2019 or 2020 where you know, now that there's been this acceleration, you can just step in and not everyone else is like watching you do it and wants to get in as well. So watch out for that slowing growth. The last and I think the most important thing or the most interesting thing maybe is the consolidation of the space of the Amazon e-commerce game. So what's happening is extremely quick consolidation. This is something that happens in industries is you go through this growth curve of rapid growth where you will have potentially you know, very fragmented industry of lots of small players who are all basically like, uh, it's open it's open space that they can all move into, which is us, individual Amazon sellers. What's happening now though, is that that open space full of all these little small sellers is just getting consolidated. And what you're gonna see is inevitably, I don't know how quickly it's gonna happen, but I know that it's going there, is this crowding out of individuals, these smaller sellers by aggregated and big companies, basically the corporatization of the of the Amazon e-commerce space. Some points when I, to, to help you understand this, um, hopefully, L large amounts of capital, which is how things develop, right? Is you need money, you need to put money into businesses or into industry, anything to make it grow. Large amounts of capital can only flow into this space, into the Amazon ecosystem via the aggregators. That has only started in the last couple of years. So what we're seeing now is the early stages Although it was really just a trickle up until what, a year, a year and a half ago, up until COVID basically. Now it's more like a fire hydrant on full blast, but, but it's completely changed in you know, two years, in a very short period of time. So that's on the one side, you've got capital, money, which has to flow down into the space. It has to flow down through these aggregators, which actually are the, they're, they're basically the conduit through which money can get into the space. And maybe this sounds like uh, you know, very conceptual, but Essentially what that means is there's more money available, which means you know, more money is gonna get pumped into PPC, which means that the seller who's selling next to you on the listing, or sorry, on the, on the search results page is an aggregator and they have this flow of money and so they can spend more on ads. So your cost per click is gonna go up and you're gonna have to spend more to compete with that person. That's in, that's in the very low level, what it looks like, but from the high level, it's because money can now flow into the space and not through you, but through your competitor, the aggregator. So on the other side, you have talent, which is not, uh, it's like coming from the bottom, right? So coming from the top is the money. From the bottom is the talent. That's 
us, that's the, these individual entrepreneurs, these solopreneurs, these small business owners um, who are very creative people, very driven, very, very hardworking, very ingenuous and, and just creative problem solvers. So there's people like you, um, that's people like me. So that talent is gonna be migrating up because the talent wants money. <laughs> the talent's there for the money one way or another. And I, I, I've already been experiencing this is, or, and seeing examples of this rather, is that current sellers who are, who are part of the talent pool exiting their business, as they do, they're more likely to become involved either as employees or as partners with the aggregators. Um, and you're gonna see this more and more is that people realize that actually they can make just as good of a living working for an aggregator with equity and sharing in the equity in the upside. So you get the capital flowing down, you get the hydrants and money flowing down into the space, you get the talent coming up, and then the confluence right in the middle where you combine the largest amounts of capital and the largest amounts of talents. That's where most of the value, and when I say value, I mean money. That's where most of the money is going to go. So who is that gonna be? Where is, what is that? Again, this is this concept, uh, conceptual model. In real life, what does it mean? It means this is where the top tier aggregators are, the ones who stand out, you know, the top three or top five or however many it ends up being. It's, it's the aggregators and it's the people who own equity in the aggregators. And again, that's probably not you. So on the, you've got this confluence there, which is again, the most successful companies who just have all of the money coming in and they have the best operational processes and you know, the, the, let's say the first, first or early movers advantage as well. And that's attracting the talent. And so it's just getting bigger and better. And then on the outside of that, away from this confluence, you've got, what have you got? You've got less successful aggregators. Um, they will get, I believe, just bought out by the ones in the middle. So it's, you also still have this flow towards the middle. Uh, and that means the talent from those less su su successful aggregators will also go towards the middle and their assets will just get bought up and go towards the middle. And also you've got successful serial entrepreneurs. So who are those? They are, I mean, they're people like me, I suppose, if I were to go back and do it, they're people who are, they're, they're the ones who are going in and building multiple brands. They know the Amazon space intimately. They, they have their own talent as well. They know how to build a brand and they know how to rebuild a brand from scratch. They know how to do it again and again and again. They are, I don't know, they, they're like laser targeting, like assassins, you know, like they can dig down into Amazon and, and I'm still speaking about this conceptually, but but maybe this is you. They can see where the value is and then they just know that when they dive in there and they see this, this pocket of value, this niche or this product idea or whatever on Amazon, they know that they can just get in there, build a brand up quickly, scale it to a million bucks, scale it to a couple of million, 10 million bucks, whatever it is, and then sell it and flip it to the aggregator and basically it goes up the chain. Um, so, or, or alternatively, they're the ones who, let's say they did that a few times and now they're the entrepreneurs who are actually creating the services or the products um, let's say to serve the ecosystem. So that could be software for, for anything, for, for PPC management. It could be software for, I don't know, whatever it could be, agencies, anything that's supporting the needs of this entire um, Amazon ecosystem. So, you know, it's a, it's a positive thing, by the way. If you're a serial entrepreneur, I'm not saying anything bad. The Amazon FBA is not dead to you. As a serial entrepreneur, as the professional doing this, the intelligent, driven, creative problem solver with capital and talent, you're fine. You're part of this big sphere you're gonna get sucked towards the middle where the money is. You're all good. You keep doing what you can do um, and, and you do you and, and we're all good. So, or if you can learn to become one, by the way, you're gonna thrive in this new world. And then on the outside, you've got the newbies. So you really don't wanna be a newbie stuck in the bottom of this world that I'm describing, stuck on this outside with little capital, little talents, no experience, and, and not much hope, I believe, coming in the next couple of years. So I really think that for you, if that is you, if I'm describing who you are on the outside right now, then yeah, it's gonna be a tough period of time. I think for you, Amazon FBA may be dead already. And if not, as this change progresses, because we are still in early days of what I'm describing, um, but as it progresses, like it's just gonna get harder and harder and harder. So a, for you, I recommend if you can't get on the inside really quickly, then, then maybe it's dead. That sounds pessimistic, right? But Again, I just believe it's true. Uh, I'm speaking to you as if as if you were here in real life with me and I just had nothing, no interest in not telling you the truth. This is exactly what I would tell you because this is exactly how I feel and and I think it I think it needs to be said. If you appreciate, by the way, the honesty, please do hit the thumbs up button just so I know that this message hits home or it, or it does the job that I'm trying to, to do with it. So what else have we got? The FBA business model. It's complex, right? It's, it's getting complex and, and 
that's the thing. That's the reason why it was so good originally was because it was simple and easy and that not everybody else knew that you could do it. If it weren't for those things, it would not be that great of an idea. And those things are not that true anymore. It's really not that simple to get started and everybody knows about it. So there's a lot more supply side competition. So you really, I do believe you really need a lot of talent and you need a fair amount of capital one or at least one of the other plus a lot of time to be able to go from the outside the, the the newbie desert circle and get onto the inside where this is where all the money is where the real life changing um the real reason why people are doing it that's that's where it's all going and what's another way i can describe this if you haven't already got the point yet like talent is specialized knowledge and and it's specialized knowledge that isn't just developed like this it isn't just developed by buying a course as as much as i previously thought it, that it was, it's, it's something that you really, it requires repetitions, lots and lots of repetitions. It's like going to the gym, you have to do something over and over again, but more so than going to the gym, you need to just not only do the thing over and over again, but you need to be able to evaluate your mistakes, reflect on what you did not do properly, and then correct the course so that you can do it better next time. The problem with the Amazon FBA business model is that it takes a long time to launch a product and launching a product is one rep. And so if it takes you six months to do one rep, and then after a year you've done two reps, or maybe you try and split stream it, do it faster and you launch three products after six months. And so you've actually done four reps after 12 months, but you're now competing against, let's, let's run with this analogy. You're now competing against this huge jacked guy in the gym who's done thousands of reps already. And not only that, he's, he's mainlining venture capital aggregator money into his veins directly. And so he's jacked up on these steroids. And it's not only that, but actually the gym is slowly starting to fill up with these jacked up guys on steroids who've all done thousands of reps. And like, they're slowly starting to take all the seats and all the equipment of the gym. And so you're trying to do your fifth rep and like suddenly you don't have any space left and, and you can't do any more reps because they're all, they're all using the equipment and pumping out hundreds of reps. It's an extreme analogy, I know, but I believe that's how it's gonna play out. I believe it's a matter of time, a matter of years for sure, but that is what's happening. So it's not that there isn't money to be made in the environment. There is going to be more and more money to be made as the space grows, but it is a question of who is making that money. The top tier aggregators will make a lot of money. People who are involved with equity um, in, in those correct, the, the correct plays in that space. You know, that's, that's the founders, that's the VCs who are backing it, that's employees who get options. Um, then it's the people on the outside, it's the serial entrepreneurs, it's the people who are just like, starting in and you know, attacking specific problems, either they're building the brands themselves or they're building, uh, again, agencies, software, products that actually service the industry rather than the actual Amazon customer. Or it is the other Amazon aggregators that end up getting bought out. And again, it all just coalesces towards the middle. In this space, more and more, I think your existing, existing advantages, pardon me, are just going to continue to accelerate and compound on each other. So to close, I guess, if you're trying to imagine you as a, as a current seller or a wannabe seller, and you're trying to imagine where your business is going to be in two to three years time if you're not selling now or you don't have plans to sell right now and you're looking ahead into that future i just ask you to ask yourself what is your advantage so i wanted to leave you with that question now in the next video like i said i'll be going into more detail on the business sale process as it was for me so i've only gone through it once but i can only share uh you know what i figured out along the way so that'll be the actual process, uh, things that I recommend, and then basically just tips to help you not only optimize your exit value, so the amount of money that you make going through it, but also such that you can minimize the time and effort involved and make it as smooth as possible as well. So make sure to subscribe, turn on the notification bell if you haven't done so, so that you get that video when it comes out. Otherwise, next steps. For me personally, uh, if you've been watching more of my recent videos, or maybe you read my blog, which link will be down below, Look, basically at this point, I've closed up almost all of my exposure to the Amazon space. Um, that's again, not to say that it's a bad space at all. It's just that for me personally, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about my future direction and future plans on a 10 year time frame now. Amazon was always this, okay, rolling 12 months. Like what's the next year got in store and what's this year got in store? And then how do I just look another 12 months into the future? Now that I'm on the other side, the, the one of the biggest benefits of having sold my business and being on the other side is that I don't need to look six months or 12 months into the future. I can look at 10 years into, into the future. For myself personally, I mean, and, and where do I fit into the world? Where do, I, where do I wanna be adding value? What do I wanna be doing with my day, with my time? What do I wanna be building? Again, not in 12 months, not in six months, but in 10 years. So this is super liberating because 
um, as the saying goes, it's like, if you give me five minutes to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first three minutes sharpening the ax. And so I basically have, you know, a few years to do nothing, <laughs> to just look around and observe and think about things. And, and from there I'll be, I'll be doing something. All I can say for now is that if I'm looking on the 10 year time frame, what is something that I would want to be working on for 10 years to, I mean, still to, to, to pay me a lot of money. Like I'm still comparing options and thinking what's, what's the most interesting and what's the most wealth building and the, the largest impact that you can make. Um, crypto is the place I want to be. So I believe that you should feel the same way as well. Um, part of what I want to do on this channel is to, is to convey that message. I'm passionate about it. Um, I know that I will lose some of you doing that, but I'm still going to talk about Amazon as far as I'm related to the space, but I'm not that related to the space anymore. So <laughs> there will be more crypto stuff coming. I know it is actually something that some of you have asked for, so that'll be coming. Um, thank you. If you're still here, if you appreciated this honest take, do leave me a comment saying so, and also hit that thumbs up button. At least that way I know that basically these, these videos go to the right audience, that you appreciate them. And I appreciate it if you do as well. So thank you for watching. Thanks for staying here and being with me and I'll see you in the next video.